What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Elder Scrolls podcast. I'm Scott here with Michael and Drew, as always, and today we are discussing the Daedric Prince Clavicus File. Which one of you guys would like to take it away, start us off? Well, this is the epitome of the deal with the devil. Clavicus Vile, the Prince of Trickery and Bargains, the Child God of the Morning Star. This is a Daedric Prince that tends to love making packs and definitely is heavily involved in mortal affairs. He just isn't going to sit on the sidelines and watch time fly by. He wants to get involved, make packs with people, packs which they will regret. And I mean, his Daedric Realm is the Fields of Regret. So, you know, I wouldn't be making any deals with him where I'd be checking the fine print extremely thoroughly. Although it does lead me to wonder, do many people who make deals with him actually write it down? Because I feel like most of them are verbal. Yeah, I'd say so, so they can be manipulated. There's something about Clavicus Vile, like we know the Daedric Prince love to meddle with mortals, but with Clavicus Vile, something about it, it never really feels malevolent or overly malicious to me like even though it often can be there's something about him that it it seems like a fascination with mortality and like free will and seeing what these things will do like a kid looking at an anthill or something like that that's how i feel about clavicus it's a really cool quote that really sums him up nicely about how explains why he's such a social creature and also explains his other component barbus so Um, Pelagius Habor, a scholar, basically says this, If we accept the premise that Clavicus Vile and Barbus are, at least in some sense, the same person, the natural question is why? Why would an entity possessing godlike power allow itself to be bifurcated? I have a number of hypotheses, but my best guess is simply this. Companionship. The life of a prince is one of near total isolation. Some princes like Hermaeus Mora and Nocturnal appear to revel in this solitude, but everything we know of Clavicus Vile indicates that he is a profoundly social being. His love of bartering, his willingness to bestow wishes upon those that engage with him, his bewitching mask, each of these things point to a being that thrives on interaction, conversation, and play. A being so inclined would likely go mad without some companion to speak to, argue with, and complain about. One might even view it as a marriage of sorts albeit an inverted one rather than two becoming one as in the pledge of mara one has become two a paradoxical reversal of the adric ritual so like you're saying there too like the playfulness of kind of what you're getting he's not it's not necessarily even um you know malicious but it 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 is in reality but he's just playing and he likes to talk and converse and he likes the trickery with words with the you know playing with words so that he can you know alter the deal perhaps that's part of his charm in a way it seems like it's kind of working on you drew because he can almost feel like if you're smart enough you can rise to the challenge and outwit him and even though you can in some respects there are some elements of it where if you think about it he will just screw you because he wants to for example with sebastian lort Um, even though he gave the Rueful Axe so that Sebastian could, you know, cure the lycanthropy of his daughter by (laughs) killing her because she became a werewolf and he didn't like that. Um, He then sends the Dragonborn after Sebastian Lort, which, you know, you could say, oh, well, I would have made it part of the deal that you will never mess with me for the rest of my life. But, you know, he wanted his axe Mm. back. It it had nothing to do with, um, you know, like Sebastian Lort's done the wrong thing yeah there's something about barbus that i I, funnily enough i'd actually written down the same quote to mention from the vile truth of barbus text that that scott you just went through before but there's something about barbus that kind of um also it disarms him a bit it it, and his willingness to i mean you you know you can argue how much of it is willing but his willingness to share his power with a subservient like a dog with with barbus as his companion is something that you couldn't imagine a lot of princes doing where i think they would be much more hoarding of power and uh, it's definitely more of a game to clavicus than it is to pretty much any other prince yeah and um with like there, there's a perfect example that happens leading up to eso with the kofringi that that i think really sums up clavicus quite well because the Kofringi were going extinct and there's there's a small tribe left who really don't want that to happen. So they turn to Clavicus and are like, please, we don't want our people to go extinct. So it, he gives them immortality in the form of like permanent undeath. 
and eventually obviously they kind of get a bit sick of that and then it comes down to the player character to decide whether to remove it from them and have them all be killed or let them continue going on like that so it's like he's kind of fascinated by their mortality and and the willingness to choose between mortality and immortality and how bad it can actually be to have immortality sometimes yeah yeah i feel like i'd still choose to be immortal i think no, even knowing all the it's downsides, really knowing all the downsides, yeah. I think you would just be like, all right. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just such so a tempting. Weird it's question. so tempting. Yeah, because you almost need an out. You know, this, is, this isn't even related to Vile anymore, but like if, you, if you've got the choice for immortality, but you cannot ex- escape it at all. Yeah. That's so scary. Eventually you'll just, oh, especially for you, you'll just end up floating in space. <laughs> thousands yeah. of years yeah i'll pass until you <laughs> arrive on the next planet but uh, yeah you know um vile's definitely a daedra you don't want to mess with i do like the idea that his deals are fair i don't actually like when he s- does something seemingly unfair the problem is it's like they're f- like you go uh, not fair, fair but by the you- agreement obviously he takes yeah, advantage yeah. of people who are in desperate situations and it seems like desperate situations lead to the you know, the most dodgy deals because people are willing to accept any conditions to get what they need in the moment. But I just feel like if the terms and conditions indicate that the mortal he's made a pact with shouldn't get screwed over, then they shouldn't. Yeah. But then again, that's part of the daedra, isn't it? That they still will just do what they want when they want, if they feel like it. Well, like one of the, like one of the best examples, are, and I'll just read the story now of this tale of um, Avalia. So the, the best known story of the mask, so the mask of Clavicus Vile, tells the tale of Avalia, a noble woman of some renown. As a young girl, she was grossly disfigured by a spiteful servant. Avalia made a dark deal with Clavicus Vile and received the mask in return. So we don't have the specifics. Yeah, because dark deal could mean she did something wrong. Yeah, or, though or the immoral. masks... Though the mask did not change her looks and suddenly shed the respect and admiration of everyone, a year and a day after her marriage to a well-connected baron, Clavicus Vile reclaimed the mask. Although pregnant with his child, Avalia was banished from the baron's household. 21 years and one day later, Avalia's daughter claimed her vengeance by slaying the baron. But it, it I kind of get the vibe that she had no idea that the mask was going to be ripped away from her a uh, year and one day after the marriage to this baron, because that's, you know what I mean? Like, it doesn't seem like a very hyper mm. you know what i mean but maybe and, that um, was part of the deal because it's quite specific a year yeah but it's and a year a and one day after the marriage yeah maybe she okay. said i i want to be i don't know some phrasing like the only thing is i do have a feeling clavicus like because we don't want to give him too much moral credit because he does screw people over like the this, sebastian this lord thing point. is obviously this a cruel thing yeah. and like you know what's crueler anyway to like to start with like you can just deny a mortal a wish or give them a wish only to rip it away from them later and watch them fall and screw them over like what's actually more vindictive and what's do you know what i mean you know, it's like giving yeah. someone a million dollars and like helping them out and their life's so great and their family and so on. And then like smashing both their legs and stealing all their money. You know what I mean? Well, you have to consider yeah. as well that when you enter into a pact with Clavicus Vile, you are by default entering into a web of pacts that he has made and can continue to make with other people. For example, and, and I mean, not that Avali would know this, but no Daedric artifact stays with someone forever. Like, I'd be very wary of that because he's mm. he doesn't have that many art. I mean, he does have a long list compared to some Daedra, but, you know, they have a limited amount of artifacts, at least that we know about, and they're going to want to hand them out to someone else soon enough. But remember, too, from the people in in the actual world, within the law, like, not yeah, everyone don't has, know like, that, a law what, keeper knowledge yeah. of, you know, a law, you know what I mean? Like That's a, what I mean. Avalia may not know that, but... It's just kind of like, you know, when you enter into a, into a pact with Clavicus Vile, he may make a pact with someone else later saying, you know, you'll be rewarded with the mask. He seems to be able to do that. I yeah. think saying that it's all a game to Clavicus yes. Vile is, is kind of fitting because it, it, he's kind of, you know, he's sometimes depicted as a kid and he's, he's kind of the kid who loves the game if he's winning and he's enjoying <laughs> himself, but then he'll take the ball away if things start to turn against him. So... You know, yeah, it, it's not always fair, but at the same time, it's not always quite as malevolent as, the, as other people. Yeah, though other people shouldn't mistake it either. Like he is still uh, somewhat, you know, egotistical, power hungry. I guess, like in regards to um, to Umbra, but also uh, the the triad of Daedra in the Somerset Isles DLC. So you know, him, Mephala, and Nocturnal teaming up, and he was going to get a piece of the 
transparent, harder transparent law, which is, you know, obviously this is all to gain some form of power. And, you know, um, he, you know, impersonate, it was, in, he uh, impersonated Sotha Sill, didn't he? Um, that was in a, the it, clock a he, him, No, it was the arch. Um, oh, no, the arch. Yeah, sorry. Arch, he is it called Arch With Vivek. Arch yeah, the Cannon Arch. Tarvis. Yeah. Yeah. He impersonated him to then, um, to try and, you know, get into the... To steal, steal the some power from keys, Vivek and, yeah. in order to get into the Clockwork City. Was yeah. it actually Vile that impersonated him? Yeah, I remember in the end of the Morrowind DLC mission, like, you, it's revealed to be... Or it could have even been Barbus. I'm not sorry, sure, but I just that's know what that I meant. I thought, I you thought meet, it was Barbus. Anyway, you meet him um, in general. So even though I feel like the uh, initial spit, split between Clavicus Vile and Barbus, like I love the the form of a paradoxical um, inversion of the Adric ritual. I, I like that just phrase. But um, that split was kind of a very like primeval kind of thing that happened to in order to like satisfy his social need and, and all that. But he is still a very like grabby, grabby god. Like he wants power, and, and it, it, and it so is quite on. an intelligent decision parents. as well, isn't it? Putting half of your power into an entity that ultimately you have full control over, but kind of keeps you in check. Well, it's interesting because he kind of like it's kind of like sometimes it seems like he doesn't in the way that Papa's sometimes when he's not complying with him, like you know, in the Skyrim. Um, thing they kind of have differences like obviously like clavicus is like the master but it's almost like what i mean is when they were a joined being i don't think they're the same being as a personality as to when they were split it wasn't just i'm going to split a little bit of barbus off i get kind of the vibe that the personality that makes up barbus was like one part of what makes up clavicus so now you've got clavicus vile like the real do you, do you know what i mean that's, like that's what i think as well yeah yeah and it could have been a but I feel like, yeah, it can also cause him problems. Like, you know, there's multiple instances. Of but ima where, imagine you know, if you could... There's a champion who, who goes against... So, you know, what he wanted to do, he wanted the Rufal... Um, he wanted you to kill Sebastian Lort um, and get the Rufal Axe. Yeah. Um, and, and that kind of thing. And he's like, oh, there you go. You get to keep the Axe. But instead... Um, and But, you know, he wants... Sorry, no, Clavicus he... Vile doesn't want Barbus back, but then Barbus wants to be rejoined. And if you convince him, you get the... Um, you've got to give up the axe, but you get the mask of Clavicus Vile. No, it's he uh, asks you to kill Barbus with the axe. Oh, kill, yeah, kill Barbus with the axe, whatever. But what I'm just saying, the ultimate thing is he doesn't want um, Barbus. But in the same way, so they kind of seem at odds in the same way as Oblivion. It's sort of like, oh, I don't want you to give Umbra back to Clavicus Vile. Like it's, they're at odds. Do you know what I mean? A fair yeah, few. Yeah, well, the, the, the split wouldn't, be wouldn't make any sense really if if Barbus was unable to defy him because then it would be pointless it would just be for appearances as opposed to actually having a not necessarily an equal but somebody to play off you know you can't just decide if if the person you're or the person or Barbus the dog you're playing off goes against you on something oh no I'll just reabsorb him and it's as simple as that so, you know like part of it is um giving away your power mm -hmm. so it is important that that Barbus has the ability to go against him. It is it yeah. is weird because he has free will, obviously, but he's also kind of a servant, and he does try and appease Clavicus Vile. Like if you read into the lore of it, in some ways he's he's written about as a kind of like you know a dog, man's best friend. Yeah. Um, but then in other ways, obviously, as we've been saying, they do have disagreements. But a lot of the time, you will find the disagreements tend to be what Barbus thinks is best. Um, mm, for the long time. Yeah. Like he's almost like yeah, the he, more rational, the more rational. He's defying mind. Vile to protect him a lot of the times because he yeah. thinks he's doing what's best for Vile. So it's kind of like a, the easiest way to phrase it is Barbus is his support subordinate, even though he's a different thing, but there's still like, there's a, power balance that's off balance, right? You know, Clav because up um, here and then Barbus. I mean, in the, but, yes, sorry. Yes. In terms of hierarchy, but I remember yeah. in, I think, reading one of the law books, it, it says that it's in terms of the actual, you know, power, the spiritual power that was split, it was pretty much equal. What was that book? Let's find you it. Because if it is the same one we were just talking about, it could sound like that because it's just like, oh, rather than two becoming one, it's one become two. But that doesn't necessarily mean equal split 50 50 down the middle. Because my and kind even of. If that even if that was the case, knowing Vile, it would be, it'd be like, oh, I have 51% ownership of the yeah. Vile company, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and you've got 49. Because I, I get the, because yeah, it's, I'm pretty sure it is Clavicus Vile would have 
a greater split of the power. Because, you know, even splitting off 30% of yourself is a massive deal. That's a big chunk of your power. But... Yeah. Um, well, because that's the thing. We're talking about how, you know, how much of it is power games and how much of it is fun for Vile. But, there, there, you know, there is no doubt um, that he's, he probably could be much more powerful, which, you know, power is a bit of an arbitrary term, talking about the Daedra in general, but he could be more powerful or more successful if he wasn't so prone to playing the fun games. Like, you know, if you look at Cyrus the Restless going into his realm to rescue his sister's soul, um, Clavicus says, you know, if, if you can successfully answer this riddle, I, I'll give you the soul back. Otherwise, I get yours as well. You know, and it's on his home turf. He could probably make it a lot worse for Cyrus. But in the end, all he's really got to do is be like, it's that classic riddle of the the one brother who always lies and the other one who never lies. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that you yeah. kind of learn in primary school. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it, it, he's definitely, yeah, he definitely can go after power, but yeah. not always. It seems from the Skyrim dialogue... Um, it just says restored to his full power when he comes back. I, I don't know if there's anything that says about the half. Because what the wiki quotes as... Because the wiki says something about... I don't know, where was it? Yeah. He's known to store up to half his power. So this way you always got to check the... Like, this is just for the guy, like fans, and everyone listening. Like, you always got to... You could read it on the wiki, but then you've got to look at the um, source of the wiki the yeah. source because they will often you know this is bound with everything everything's going to have a little bit of interpretation on a primary source yeah i mean here's, gotta... here's the wiki as well barbus acts as a repository for around half of vile's power um yeah and then when you click the source it is the vile truth of barbus by pelagius mm. habor yeah yeah so, so like it, that's a, it's a reasonable assumption yeah. but it's not necessarily Confirmed. true if that makes sense yeah. like i feel like and, and the only reason i would lean on more that it's an uneven split of power is just because clavicus vile is able to enforce you know to you know barbus is seen as the subordinate and so on it doesn't really mm. you know what i mean what and i mean it's it's kind of a testament to barbus's loyalty in the the more modern history of clavicus vile because we'll talk about umbra a lot more i'm sure soon but um, if you imagine that, you know, just um, for the argument's sake, uh, Clavicus Vile has 70% and Barbus has 30% of the of the power split, and then Clavicus Vile gets screwed over in the creation of Umbra, yeah. you have um, Vile being really vulnerable. Theoretically, Barbus would probably hold more of the prince's overall power after that split, but you'd see that because of their roles, he'll protect his sick master or his weak master rather than anything potentially sinister mm. you know yeah um because he does talk about his power being weakened in skyrim doesn't he and says yeah. something like if he was at full power he could kind of just like click his fingers and um what was it kill something about was it the civil uh, yeah, like the entire population or something yeah like. something massive yeah yeah he says oh that feels much better you forget how nice supreme power feels until you've been stuck in a cave for a few years um, but yeah, you either way. Yeah, anyway, they just yeah, yeah. Umbra, it definitely wouldn't have been taking taking from Barbus's power. It would have been Clavicus Viles when he came to the witch asking her to make him a sword. Yeah, probably. You know, which I, is I ironic because Clavicus Vile being the you know the master of the deal or the master of the mm -hmm. art of the deal. He got screwed over. Um, mm -hmm. Although he, it says he, what, they kill the witch? But it was too late anyway. People think that witch yeah. was Shea Gorath in disguise, which would make yeah. sense considering... I've always wondered what the source for that was. Because I hear, yeah, it's every, it, every time you see Nainra wear, it does mention that. Um, but yeah, she managed to hide it before Clavicus could kill her. Yeah, well, there shouldn't be many sources on her, so there's only one book, three... Tamriel, oh, the Jaeger and Bagan stuff, so... And I'm fairly sure, yeah, that doesn't mention Shagorath. It doesn't. That does Yeah, maybe it's, uh, as we talked about in our Iceberg podcast, some of that monkey truth, some theory <laughs> that just seems so, so yeah, cool it that it fits in and everyone just believes it. It doesn't actually get explicitly mentioned. 
Mm, no, but you, I think it's more of a... Oh, no, 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 no. Umbra Creation for Skyrim Special Edition. The <laughs> Creation Club. <laughs> really? That's what's linked. My bad. My I biggest think. pet peeve... Oh, no, hold on. Maybe it's... Big if true. Sorry, go on. I was just saying my biggest pet peeve <laughs> with it, with wikis is including Creation Club as canon. Drives me nuts. Yeah, yeah I guess you have to, though, right? Like, but do, do you? Because it, it's... Bethe- like Creation Club is Bethesda even though it's just paid mods but it's not right? a DLC like the acknowledgement that's mod in the same way like the Dwemer Mud Crab or like you know the kind of Christmas themed one or like you know like if they do it it's kind of like it's you, you know are they all canon like there's the zombie apocalypse one or something like that isn't there that? literally yeah, a, a Zelda bit. sword or something <laughs> Yeah, like the Nintendo <laughs> Switch Master Sword in in oh, yeah. Skyrim is not <laughs> canon. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, maybe I don't know where it's actually. To okay, I, I, one this has got it credited as the Lord of Souls book, so it's from the Lord of Souls. Book. Right. The the Sheogorath claim, I think. I'm sure it is from somewhere that it's not just. I mean, um, regardless of the source, we could all agree that it's a very likely theory. Just yeah. because Shag Goroth has be tricked case. many other Daedra before and seems to take mm. great joy in it. Could have been one of his accords of madness that hasn't been written down. <laughs> See, Clavicus yeah. Files got a few Daedric artifacts, but I feel like just because of the nature of him, I feel like he should have plenty of cool ones and even a bigger list just because it kind of, you kind of get the, you know, the Rueful Axe was created um, for the sort of purpose when Sebastian Lort was looking for a solution. I feel like he's the kind of person that wants lots of artifacts to kind of create deals and stuff and yeah. trading and stuff. And so I'll give you this thing if you do this. Mm. And, because he has such um, a limited supply, it leads to the situations like Avelia's where he's like, well, sorry, I've only got five things <laughs> to bargain with. I got to take this one back and start again. Yeah. He's also got the bitter cup, a sacred artifact that you, you drink from, right? Uh, you sip from the bitter cup and it um i know it gives you a bunch of buffs in morrowind i think but let's have a look what Uh, it gives you it permanently increases your highest attribute by 20 that's right and decreases your lowest by 20 and so for someone who's making a min max build that can be pretty good but it doesn't raise anything above 100 yeah, it's kind of... It's and the, the liquid honest. inside is referred to as its nectar. You can drink its nectar. And the other one, which is a cool thing too, the, the Fey Falcon, um, but possibly being a fictional artifact. The quill enchanted mm. with the soul of a Daedric... It, so it is enchanted with the soul of a Daedric servant of Clavicus Vile. Named. Was named Fey yep. Falcon. Yeah. And then it makes you just the best rider of all time. Um, but mm. it manipulates your thoughts as well. So one of the pe- people who were using it was driven to suicide. Um, even writing notes with Faye Falcon, like his suicide note, with the same quill. Yeah. But um, the other, obviously... So I guess we can sort of just start dumping into... Um, Artifact. Jumping into Umbra more specifically too. Do you want to... Someone want to take the... I wanted to talk about the mask of Clavicus Vile. Oh, yeah. I guess for some reason I felt like we kind of talked... But yeah, We I guess did, we but, but it is yeah. cool. And uh, I found it interesting how you've talked about it before, Scott, but the spelling of mask is kind mm. of similar to like um, masquerade, but also the thing that used to happen in royal courts, like the singing and dancing and stuff that, yeah. was, that was called and it's mask. Just- yeah, so there's the masquerade, the big ordeal involving singing, dancing, and acting, but there's also the word mask with a Q is additionally related to the word mas- um, masquerade in being, um, sorry, one of its few meanings, most contemporary one, to act or live under false pretenses, which, you know, is exactly what happens yeah. with the Valia. Like, but she's actually horrifically scarred. And The mask was a form of festive courtly entertainment, like literally called the mask, spelt like with yeah. the Q-U-E that flourished in the 16th and early 17th century Europe, um, though it was developed earlier in Italy. So it was all, you know, um, it it all just ties into the theme that I like and the whole glamour and it's all, you know. So it's got the the double meaning of like, you know, it's called Mask of the Q because it's a mask like quite physically and literally, but then also the The song and dance, the glamour, also masquerading as someone else or as someone you're not, I should say. 
Tony, I feel like we've tread a lot of this ground before in the Daedric Artifact yeah, video. Yeah, we have. I just remember talking we about have. this, but I'm like... Because yeah. I really love the the glamour, the word glamour for... um. For like the enchanting effects, so like a like a glamour, like you know, like like Scottish. Mm. Um, is it? Isn't it the root yeah, well, word of grammar or something? Isn't it? Isn't that? Aren't they related? No, somehow, I'm not sure. Hold on. Yeah, because I think the dev said the uh, the inspiration for the mask is from the Jim Carrey movie, The Mask. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> um, yeah, right. Yeah, which is why it looks so unusual in Daggerfall. Yeah. The real inspiration, isn't it yeah. something yeah. like right. a Henry? That's a, that's a little, <laughs> little Drew tale. Isn't it a Henry V's <laughs> helmet or something? Like there's this really weird horned helmet. Potentially. I mean, a lot of Daedric artifacts are, t- are taken from real life historical things, which yeah. is surprising because you'd think real life things would be quite boring. I, I do wonder about The Mask if... When you wear it, do people see it, you know? Because... Well, that's one thing about Avalia. Like, how is she kissing her husband... Exactly. ...when they're exactly. creating their kid? It's so, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, King Henry VIII... Yeah. Um, he, his horned helmet. It it's kind of looks... Not exactly similar, but it's one wacky-ass-looking helmet. I'll put it up on screen, yeah. but... But how do you um, think the mask worked in terms of, like, um, do you have to wear it? Because let's just say, for example, there was a big celebration and someone's wearing the mask... Um, if someone like some artist made a painting of that, that supper and there's everyone standing around celebrating, would the mask be in that painting? And then people could look at the painting and not be under the effect of the mask because it's a painting of what the painter was looking at and be like, Oh, why is this queen or this, this lady wearing this massive weird mask? You know what I mean? Or does no one see it? Yeah, I mean, I I think you actually see it, but it's so it's got such a strong enchanting feeling and presence that you just find yourself, you know, it's just completely alluring, and you're and you're. Do you know what I mean? It doesn't become weird anymore. It's instantly. But how you know, could you call like someone glamour. beautiful who's wearing it if you can't even see their face? Like, how would you kiss them or touch their face or, you know? Yeah, I would say just the the charm, dude. It, you're under a spell, essentially. So she was wearing. Her, I mean, her neck would have been so thick with muscle gains. Like what? She's just wearing yeah. this metal helmet twenty four seven. It could also be something that is that is um that maybe like projects the most like attractive sort of version. Imagine of, the of, smell. <laughs> 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 Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> but like, oh. I imagine like you can project. Who you um, can't take it off. But ima- yeah, but I'm just saying, imagine the face, um, you know, you, what you consider the most beautiful person ever is projected, is, is what's projected to you, but someone else sees something different. So maybe it is like functional. Yeah, that would be cool. Do you think that would be cool. when we all look at it in game and on the wiki pages and stuff like that, do you think we all see a different face? Whoa. Whoa. No. <laughs> what, do you, what do you see? Huh? Out of curiosity, what do you see, Scott? A horned mask. with a. What does the face look like? Uh, with a mustache, it, bro. <laughs> really, the 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 most beautiful sight in the world to you is a what a mustachioed man. <laughs> Interesting. How about yeah, you, Michael? That's it. <laughs> I don't know. I I think I'm seeing the same thing, which is a bit strange. Oh, really? Okay. For me, yeah. For me, it's like a beautiful woman. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Mm, whatever. Well, that's interesting. By the way, what I was talking about there, that glamour was originally a Scottish alteration of grammar. Glamour. It was. Um, it was. This article explains blah, blah, blah. I actually got to go. <laughs> you could keep talking for a bit. I've actually got to find the full thing. I just read the title. But they're related, the words glamour and grammar. Um. Mm. Cool story. Um, um, well, for the mask. Yeah, because I think the thing that makes the mask cool is the story of Avalia. The Umbra. Is there, is there more to say about the mask or should we talk about Umbra? No, we can move to Umbra, the extremely corrupting jet black sword that i just thought was the coolest sword i've ever seen when just i first real, was playing oblivion oh he's got more to say about grammar. just real quick do, do you know how like um originally like magic and stuff is like strongly related to like words and spells mm-hmm. and so on and like even to a degree i guess this is an interesting word you know a spelling of a word yeah when you write it Ooh. it's like spelling but but when you cast like you know what grammar is but <laughs> gla- but glamour being related is like casting glamour and enchanting someone or something it's almost like with a word yeah what you, what's the funny no just you're obsessed with grammar <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah no but that's no, cool it is it is but yes no it's good we've we've got um you know because the the main thing that happens if you if you ever mess up your grammar 
there's a certain type of people that you know attack you straight away and they're all just wizards i guess yeah they just you know they're master magicians but um umbra i mean i like with umbra it, i don't know what it is about the books i like i'll be be honest i haven't read the lord of souls book and the other book um i forget infernal the name infernal city but infernal city but i find they're just so confusing to to fully properly grasp the story of umbra because like, obviously it, it gets passed down between like several um mortals find it and they kind of get corrupted by it and become umbra and there's obviously um and then eventually it gets back to clavicus vile but then between the events of oblivion and skyrim things get really weird um which one of you guys can elaborate on if you want was well i mean it cuts off a part of clavicus files realm and and kind of just gets even more powerful and t then takes on like a an entity a more humanoid figure this dark being with um what is it eyes like holes into nothing yeah and it's yeah. like hiding on the outskirts of of the field of regrets waiting for the ingenium to create a large enough hole to mundus that he can launch the sword through it so that he'd be freed and yeah it's yeah. cool and all but like you know you know like glamour was the <laughs> word related to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah <laughs> so i was three off there <laughs> you know, i'm saying it was confusing enough and then <laughs> just destroy the train of thought but yeah the, the whole ingenium story and then you've got um the thrusting the sword through the chest of atrobus who then dives into the ingenium and explodes and then umbra supposedly gets completely destroyed after that except it appears again pretty soon later when a random guy finds it and falls in a hole and breaks both his legs and uh <laughs> you know the that whole story so is that part of the book or is that part that the oh no that creation gets into the creation club. Club. Ah, yeah lovely yeah thoughts i thought so i'm like that yeah sounds that sounds not too crash up <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah mm. uh, you know i really want to i really want to read those novels but as i'm reading them write notes for every single chapter and then turn them into youtube videos because there are so many people who don't want to read them and if you can just have the infernal city for those who can't be bothered to read it and i explain e in e each chapter say 20 minutes you'll know the whole book yeah i think it'd be really cool yeah the um another i guess i guess we can talk about just to like each of their like uh clavicus files presence in all of the different games which you know more so unfamiliar with some of the early ones but there's a whole dagger for one it's pretty straightforward you kill a werewolf and you get the mask of clavicus file in return it's nothing much um and his actual quest is the bitter cup in um Morrowind. in Morrowind but what I like too is the Mask of Claucus Vile is also there but it's owned by a necromancer a Nord necromancer called Sorkfield the Raven there's this actually there's a really cool artist and I've forgotten his name but he does do some like he kind of does these like hyper realistic almost like I'm not a pro artist so I don't know what the type of painting's called but it's kind of like a somewhat blurryish, realistic kind of version of all these Morrowind characters and he does one of Sorkfield the Raven um you know standing there with a the mask it's it's really cool this is the necromancer that you get told to kill by one of these imperials because he's trying to make a good impression on the dark elves right about the empire his view is kind of like the dark elves hate necromancy so go kill this necromancer yeah i mean i can't remember what I, i'll just look at the script of what i i said about him um from the don't i uh, fear the mask or something i forgot what we titled that video but um, yeah, I said, I do love his name and I wonder if the moniker, um, the Raven gives any hints about his past, perhaps connection to Nocturnal, though that could be grasping at straws. Um, regardless, the interesting part is what you find on your corpse when you kill him. Is, oh, at the mask. Mm. Yeah. I mean, on the topic of the bitter cup, um, I, I feel like the connection isn't explicitly drawn, but it makes a lot of sense that the, the bitter cup would have something to do with the uh the cyrodiil vampirum order you know we haven't gone over that but there's essentially oh, like yeah. the the order of vampires in cyrodiil who have clavicus vile as their patron and it says we owe our successes and social stature to clavicus vile um so it's kind of um 
insinuated that the idea is that these vampires are in high positions of power inside the empire and then when you look at the um the bitter cup it says only the strongest of the emperor's servants are advised to make covenant with prince clavicus and a war and even them are, are warned against sipping from the bitter cup and it seems like the bitter cup being kind of a uh you know like the cup that you drink from to kind of make a uh, like a secret pact with him in the um in the higher ups of the empire could be related mm. well like but, a part of the reason to the Sawfield the raven guy like being a necromancer you having the most clavix file if you know if you're doing all these disgusting necromancy experiments like everyone will have a better opinion of you if you've just got this enchanting mask same sort of deal like that you kind of get is the why that the serial vampires are so powerful is because they have all of like you know the um charms and stuff that are given mm. through the their patron clavicus vial and all of their uh bits and pieces so it seems like clavicus vial's got a few th- i mean i then again the bitter cup could just make you like stronger or faster and less intelligent or something but yeah, then also so it's probably something you might not notice as well like imagine imagine if you drank from the bitter cup and we just go off the moral in mechanics and you needed to i don't know lift something really heavy and sudden or win a fight and suddenly you're really strong you destroy your opponent you're feeling great but then later you just find that you can't really remember what you something you wanted to remember and it's kind of like your mind fading if you wanted to represent mm. it by something that's not just like an in-game stat and suddenly your memory is just really fried or you're just you trying to calculate things is really slow and you're like oh that's why yeah you know i mean i feel like from a law perspective it's just the sort of you know, it, it gives you some great benefit and then takes away something is all they're trying to translate into gameplay terms with attributes. But I feel like in the within the law that there could be a greater, you know, expansion like you were just sort uh, of I saying. Just, yeah, I, I see it as just a kind of a, a ritualistic item that is just essentially, regardless of the context of the pact, is just used to kind of um, put the official stamp on whatever deal is being made. I feel like that that could be a, a use of the bitter cup. It's kind of universal and not tied down into any game mechanics or anything. But what? so every time I mean, you make a deal, deal he's like, "Now drink." <laughs> well, not necessarily, but like, um, I don't know. Do you, do you know what I'm getting at? When it's kind of like you know, almost like a a religious thing, like you know, drinking the sacred uh, the blood of or you, things like that. Essentially, that it can be used for these kind of packs, like the Cyrodiilum Order. I think it's a lot more interesting than just drink from this cup and you're a little bit stronger for, yeah, for an hour 20 so, you know, it's 20 a, yeah yeah it, it but you know who knows we we need to learn more about well, it I guess. well that's all that's all, like you know like we apply generally to all of the um the daedric artifacts is seen through a law context versus a a gameplay context is very different like you know 20 percent price be- better prices in mm. skyrim for the mask clavicus file is not it's the actual you know breadth of its power mm. in in reality you know what i mean yeah. Or even, you know, fortifying your personality by 20 points. It still doesn't... It's just... It's the easiest for people to think. Gameplay is only a representation which is limited by the gameplay systems, you know? If there isn't an attribute for speed, but these boots are supposed to make you super speed or something like that, you know what I mean? It's it the same as the boots of Spring Hill Jack. Like, if you're a character that hasn't invested in, you know, being agile, fast, and jumping high and all this you're not going to become some super high jumper because it's plus 50 acrobatics, right? Like mm. the person who doesn't have this super high jumping artifact but has trained in acrobatics will be able to jump higher than you. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. it is just in-game. I guess we could talk a bit about... Oh, could I just mention, I just want this image on the screen ASAP. In Red Guard, um, Barbus impersonates Cyrus and it's the funniest thing you'll ever see. Yeah, I think I have seen before, yeah. <laughs> it's his dog next to Clavicus Vial with Cyrus's head, but just the graphics of um, Red Guard make it so ridiculous. If you just go to Barbus on the wiki and scroll to the bottom, <laughs> <laughs> it's just so ridiculous. Um, yeah, that's cursed. Yeah, it is. It's For one sure of those cursed. like cursed memes. But I guess we could talk about the Fields of Regret a bit, which is Clavicus Vile's realm. Mm. Um, it kind of looks like a tranquil countryside. Like, it looks quite nice, but then, obviously, it ends up being quite eerie. Um, mm. There's, like, buildings, and uh, it looks very different in Elder Scrolls Online, if you look at um, 
to its description. It just looks a bit different. I feel like I liked what Redguard was trying to present it as a bit more. Yeah. And it's supposed to be populated with Scarfen, right? And and often, like, you know, Clavicus even kind of presents himself as a Scarfen-like kind of creature. Most of the time. Yeah, and Barbus as well. Barbus has been many things. Um, Mm. Barbus has been the creeper. The the scamp. If you... if you look at like if you look at the Daggerfall sprite for uh, Clavicus Violent Barbers, Barbers, Barbers looks, looks like a hundred times, yeah, really intimidating. Like almost like a, it's like he's like as big as or bigger if he was standing on his back legs than Clavicus File, with yeah. like glowing red eyes and horns and stuff, like a demonic hound. Hey, people are people are like the occasional um, side thing. I was just looking at the uh, pictures of Clavicus Vile down the bottom, and there's a picture of him in as like a shadowed kind of figure in in the Somerset announcement trailer, and it looks really cool. And I was just thinking back to like you know, oh, wouldn't a wouldn't a Elder Scrolls series be really cool? But you know how we were, there was talks about there was like rumors flying around about a Netflix doing an Elder Scrolls series. But if any of them do an Elder Scrolls series, they should do it like CGI, like just the trailers, like they do for Elder Scrolls Online, mm-hmm. like a big cinematic. Like that'd be so cool. Like I could really, really vibe that. Like you know mm-hmm. how like back in the day, I don't know if you ever saw Beowulf, the movie where it was all um, done with like mocap and CGI. Yeah, it was that was like kind of like the slightly early days of like it was a little bit uncanny valley looking. Yeah, but you could see where it was leading, and it's and yeah, yeah it look it does look interesting. I mean, one thing about the fields of regret, I, I when I especially when I look at the the way it's depicted in Red Guard, I kind of like the idea of it it looking really picturesque and perfect, and 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 you know you can just imagine getting comfortable and and settling in there. But almost like a uh, tranquility lane situation in Fallout Three. It's yeah. like it, it, they sh- kind of like his deals. There should be kind of like it's not quite as nice as it seems, and then there are really like slightly unsettling, disturbing elements to it. That's kind of how, like how I imagine it would be if you were to properly explore its cities and stuff like that. Mm, yeah. But you know, but there isn't a, a great deal. I always thought I remembered more off. of these disturbing elements being written down. And I can't seem to source them right now. Unless it's a different realm. I remember something about maybe the, sm- the smell, like actually like a really disgusting scent or something like that. Um, it could be another yeah, realm. I'm not sure. Yeah, it might be. I, I only really remember the sort of uh, rolling hills and scarf and... Yeah. Yeah. think that's about uh it is any anything else to say on clavicus file any hot takes (sighs) i guess the last thing i mean i don't even know if there's much to say about the scarf in other than the fact you know are they they're kind of a relatively simple horned daedric creature like potentially related to the herns but really you only jump to that conclusion because of the horns anyway Mm. Oh yeah, okay. See, I, don't know if I found I found it. So the reference is the Lord of Souls novel. Um, mm, right. It appears as an idyllic countryside dotted with merchant utopias, fields of white clovers, woodland meadows, twisted foliage, and odd melted-looking places, which is starting to get unsettling. But then mm. the air smells of both perfume and rotting flesh while the sky is blue with cottony clouds and greenish gray streaks that stay in the atmosphere. That's what I, that's what I remember. Yeah, okay. The mix of perfume, but also rotting flesh is really creepy and gross. I really yeah, that like, adds a lot of character. Yeah. To do, you, do you know that, yeah. uh, you know, that famous painting with, it's like a kind of a barren landscape, but then there's like clocks melting over mm-hmm. the branches and stuff. Like that's what I imagine when I hear melting places. Yeah. Mm. That's pretty cool. Any hot takes? Yeah, yeah, that's hot it. That's takes. cool. That's um, Dali's painting. Yeah, yeah, no hot takes really. I I, I like Clavicus Vile a lot. I think it's no surprise that his artifacts tend to be the most interesting as well, because they all have interesting stories that relate to mortals. Um, I mean, Umbra. I think we've concluded before that Umbra and the Mask are the so two best, t- yeah, or two of the yeah. top three or four at least. Drew, did you have any theories on Vile and Dagon? If I did, I've now forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> Something about that pairing sounds weirdly familiar about a certain theory. 
this is going to be one of those situations where we've stopped recording the podcast. I'm like, oh yeah, that was a great <laughs> idea to talk about, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm sure it'll the come back head. in another episode. That's the good thing about it. This is not the last time we talk about Clavicus file. Yeah. Yeah. So ladies and okay. gentlemen, we come to the end. We will see you in the next episode. And remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Unless it's a glamour. <laughs>